Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. I remember being so afraid of rejection from other people that um, I was literally just in this personal prison. And my mind was so consumed with what I wasn't. And there, I was hopeless. It wasn't until I opened the Bible and the Word of God could pierce into my mind, who knew the deepest, darkest parts of me. It was like shooting rays of light into my mind, day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment. With the Word of God, He has made me new, and He still does every single day. Fear, of course, you know, I get fearful in things, we all do. But then I use this scripture, for God did not give me a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. And, I can, and then I use, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I do it when I don't want to fold clothes. I do it when I don't want to mow the yard. I do it when something seems like it's overwhelming and hard. Um, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I, ha I have to. I have a life now that I thought only I could, I could have only if I was married or if I came from a different family, only if I was good enough. Mm -mm. I just needed the Word of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, the love of Jesus that came and said, Are you ready? And Father God, with His beautiful Word, and I'm healed. Woo. I needed that. That was awesome. How about it as well? Amen? Anybody? Anybody need that today? It's so good to see you. You can tell, you know, that we're heading into this new series. I'm so hyped about this particular series of messages. I'm kind of usually kind of hyped, but uh, I'm real excited about this series of messages. We're calling it the next 500. It was on uh, October the 31st in 1517, 500 years ago, this Halloween, that a little known priest, he was actually a professor at a, at a university in a place called Wittenberg, Wittenberg, Germany. And uh, his name was Martin Luther. Some of you know, and I'm going to give you more history than, than normal today, as we think back on this first Reformation, some of you know that on that day, it was, it was all uh, Saints Eve. It was Hallow's Eve. We call now Halloween. Uh, All Hallows Saints Day was the next day. Hallows Eve, Hallows Saints Eve was the day before they would celebrate and honor all of the saints that had gone before. So all the dead saints and others were honored and venerated and celebrated, if you will. Not sure how we ended up. Well, I do, but it's a long history how we ended up with with pumpkins and ghosts and dead skeletons and such. And now you're putting them out in your front yard and repent. But anyway, that's a, that's a whole nother deal. It's a whole nother deal. Love the candy and all the above, but and the Fall Fun Fest is going to be awesome, by the way. But we, we've come a long way from where it was. And on that, that day, Luther went to the door of the Wittenberg Church, what seems odd to us today, and he took his 95, 95 grievances that he had against the church. This was a Catholic church. It was the only church. It was the universal church. And he went and he nailed his 95 theses on the door of the Wittenberg church. Now, this seems odd to us today, but, at, but then it was a way to enter into public discourse. It was like writing you know, for this section, like an op-ed uh, section of the paper, uh, an editorial. There's no newspaper. Gutenberg Press was just then invented, starting to come into play, and would, would, would come into play big time in the Reformation, a new technology that was about as, as much of a shift as the internet. Um, because he had to write down, literally, and then post pages of these 95 theses it became known as, as he was um, just offering his public opinion. Now, in our day, it must, much like posting, perhaps, on social media. 
you know, like just, just tweeting out something that just everybody jumps on. Uh, you know, that kind of a thing where he just says, bam, here's what I think. Everybody jump in. So it was a way of debating. There was no television, of course. There was no, um, there was no internet, nothing. So there was this way of saying, let's all jump in. Here's what I think. Now, little did he know that that act would be the spark of the Great Reformation. And he would find himself, this little-known, formerly monk, now priest, university professor, would find himself in front of the most powerful people on the planet. He'd find himself in no time, in two debates, and then standing before an emperor, pope, and all the papal authorities as this young priest said, I think that we've gotten off track. Now, hang with me. Um, historians, theologians tell us that every 500 years of church history, the church goes through this uh, major shift after this big upheaval. What happens then, you can th think with me for a moment. You've got Christ, of course, who splits history from B.C. to A.D., the Christ event, the great incarnation, the great salvation that comes to us in Christ. 500 years later, you watch the fall of Rome. That, that now, and, and a lot of that was the church then starts to spread and no longer is, is the Pope uh, and, and this, this co-opting of government and religion now breaks down. The major shift in the church. Then 500 years later, 1054, we see the Great Schism. If you know anything about church history, the Great Schism is that the church splits east and west. So you have the Eastern Orthodox Church that splits away from the Roman Catholic Church where the Pope and all that he says and all the traditions of the Catholic Church are no longer a part of their authority. 500 years later, right at 1500, you see the, the Great Reformation, the Great Christ event, okay, the Great Fall of Rome. You see the Great Schism. You see the Great Reformation where Martin Luther, Zwingli, John Calvin, John Huss, Wycliffe, Tyndale, some names you've heard, they all come into play as leaders in this Great Reformation, which brought about, it was the Protestant Reformation. What Luther was doing when he nailed his 95 Theses to the wall, to the door of the Wittenberg Church, he was protesting against the Catholic Church. Now, you and I, as Protestants, we are protesters. You know that, right? That we are still, if you will, protesting against uh, anything but Christ alone, we've sung about, Scripture alone, grace alone, faith alone, to the glory of God. Alone. Some say, well, is there still the need for a reformation? Is there still this need for protest? The short answer is yes. The long answer is absolutely yes. And we, we're not going to get into a lot of, the, though, there, though we must, theology between the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church. That's not really the point, though it was clearly the point of the reformation. So we're going to come into that a bit. There's still vast differences, by the way. Uh, between Catholic theology and Protestant theology. And we could dive into some of that, but the greater concern, the greater need for a reformation, the new reformation in our day, is that we now live in a culture of biblical illiteracy. And it's even in the church. And we need a great reformation. So now, 500 years after the Reformation, many of us, myself and others, we, you, are praying for really a great awakening. Some are calling this the great emergence. And here's what happens. Hang with me. I'm not the only one here who, who, who loves church history, but I think this is important for us to place our message in context and a lot of history today. Um, what happens every time the church goes through this upheaval, through this Reformation, three things take place. One, there is this... Um, this encrusted kind of hard shell of an institutionalized, empowered Christianity that has to be broken, even shattered. And what before, what happens is this reformation takes place and a new form, a new life emerges. That happens first. The second thing that happens is that the old fossilized form of Christianity, in whatever form it is in that period of time, uh, 
also experiences a renewal and revival back to more of a purity of the gospel and the scripture. We see it over and over again through history. And then the third thing that happens as a result of this upheaval is that the gospel is advanced into new geographic, demographic areas as never before. We're calling it the great emergence in these days, some authors, theologians, because it's still emerging. What is happening? What is going on? You sense it. Anytime there's Jesus plus something, there's a need for reformation. But the greater battle... The greater protest that needs to take place, my prayer is that it happened first in my heart. Lord, I'm going to protest against anything in my life that is not Christ. Anything that's guiding me in my life that is not Scripture. And in the same, I pray for our church. Lord, let us be a church that's centered on your word, that is focused on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I think that's what's happening in this new Reformation. It's in part, I think in large part, as has always been the case, it's, a, it's, it's getting back to the gospel of Jesus Christ, not Jesus plus, not Jesus co-opted by a philosophy or ethnicity or nationality or political party or view, but Christ and scripture alone guiding our lives. And today we're going to talk about this first piece of, of the Reformation, which is a sola scriptura. And so when we think about this, I want you to look here with me. Look at the five solas with me for a moment. Here's where we're heading over these next months ahead. Now, the word sola, of course, a lot of this is in Latin because that was the only way that uh, the priest and the church spoke into it. The people didn't speak Latin, uh, most of them. So uh, it'd be like you not understanding uh, what the scriptures are written in today. And I'm just going to tell you what they say, Right. And I'm going to tell you, by the way, that if you, not unlike our prosperity gospel today, if you offer indulgences to me and the church, uh, we could give you a certificate that will help you be forgiven for your sin. The more you pay, the more you'll be forgiven. The more money you have, the more privilege you'll have in the church because the church and government are essentially co-opting together. And so you can give these indulgences, literally pay for your sins to be forgiven. And, and, and the, the laity, which literally means ignorant or common, unlearned, would hear from those in positions of power, and the church held sway over the people. But you can see here, the first one that we're going to look at today is Scripture alone, sola gratia, grace alone on the eighth, sola fide, faith alone, solus Christus, Christ alone, Sola Dio Gloria, to the glory of God alone. And we're going to walk through these each week because these became really the five major battle cries of the Reformation. And uh, as we walk and look at history, we're going to talk through this great need for us to experience a great Reformation in our day. Now, the first one, and you can go ahead and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, by the way. 2 Timothy 3. We're going to look there at one single passage. And what I'm going to do is continue to set this up. So again, more more history than normal today. Um, But the Reformation focused on these five areas. But the first was Solo Scriptura. Um, You see, in the 1400s, again, the church had become, can I say it? And I'm going to simplify a lot of history here, very complex history. The church had become a money-making enterprise. Um, and sure enough, there was, this, there was this blend of those in power, emperors and popes and such papal authority, that was really uh, held sway over the people, the Roman Empire. And, and so one of the ways that, again, you could pay for your sins was to uh, pay for indulgences. And the reformers rose up and said, no, it, it, it's Christ alone who forgives sin. And it's scripture alone, not the authority of a man in a position, a pope or papal council. It's scripture alone that is our authority, our sole authority. So sola scriptura became the battle cry. Now, this didn't sit well with those in privileged power and authority. And, and by the way, the St. Peter's Basilica, anybody ever been to Rome and seen St. Peter's? An incredible, you know, the largest church on the planet building. And um, it was being built during Martin Luther's time. The indulgences being paid, the money was going to build the largest structure of a church that had ever been built and ever been built since. 
So the people, though the scriptures were in Latin, the Vulgate only, not in the language of the people, only the priest and, and the pope and others could understand the scriptures, so the people were left in the dark. Thus, the dark ages, until the Reformation came along, this history-altering shift. But Martin Luther uh, was formerly a monk, and he uh, was in the monastery for a season of time where he was trying to pay penance for his sin. The idea of Christ as judge terrified him. Because he knew that he was a sinner, and the more he did, the more uh, anguish and despair came into his life, because he knew he could not pay for his sin. In fact, it's, it's said that he would spend as long as six hours in confession uh, while a monk. Now, I don't know what kind of trouble you get into as a monk, but he knew deep in his heart that he was sinful to the core. He read the scriptures, and he knew of the depravity of the soul. And as he sought to overcome his sin by doing all that was necessary, his dad wanted him to be a, a lawyer. He went into the ministry because he wanted to do all that was necessary to find forgiveness for his sin. And so he'd get up at four in the morning along with his brothers, and, and they would pray, and they would do all that was necessary. But what happened to Luther, he began to look in the scriptures, and, and, and he found himself discovering the gospel of free grace, that Christ had come and was offering to him salvation, not through his good works, but through the work that Christ had already accomplished for him. And so one of those verses, before we get to 2 Timothy, is Romans 1, 17. Let's look at this together and let's read it. You can see it on the screen. Let's read it together. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Okay, y'all can do better than that. Hold on. This is the word of God. Let's read this together. Okay, sorry. Let's dive in again. For the gospel, yeah, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. All right? So he reads this. He sees this. And he says, oh my gosh, there's a righteousness that comes from outside of me. Now, that wasn't just this verse, but others. What he called alien righteousness. It wasn't my righteousness trying to be good enough to appease God and to gain his favor. But instead, Christ had come, and now it's his righteousness imputed, right, infused into me. I become now the righteousness of, of, of God in Christ. I'm now standing before a holy God who has forgiven me. And, and he would go on to, to experience this great uh, salvation, as we all do when we come to understand this. And when he discovered that there was this righteousness outside of himself, he wrote this later. When I discovered that, the gospel, I was born again of the Holy Ghost. And the doors of paradise swung open and I walked through. And it changed his life. Then he realized that much of what he'd learned all of his life, much of what the church was teaching at the time, was wrong. Again, he found himself in a position that he had never dreamed that he would. The posting of his grievances lit a fire, and it changed the world. And it's why we're here today. And the main challenge of his 95 Theses was this thing of indulgences, that somehow you could pay for your own sins to be forgiven apart from Christ. In fact, the title of his 95 Theses was actually Disputation or Argument of the Power of Indulgences. And again, this did not sit well with the Pope. The Gutenberg Press took effect, his theses were printed and then distributed, and suddenly his writings over time were going across the Roman Empire and uh, they came after him in the end. He has an incredible life, and it's worth thinking about and talking about what we're going to press on. Scripture alone, I want to talk about today. Not a philosophy, not traditions of the church, not anything else, but Scripture alone. And so the Bible tells us, look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. After setting all this up, we're going to seek to understand why is this so important and how can we apply it to our lives. It's why you're here today. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. 
All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete. That is, that, that's mature. That's not finished. It's not uh, other words that we see. It's not teleos. It's, it's the word mature, completely mature, equipped for every good work. So the Bible says all Scripture, right? That word is pas in the Greek, all Scripture is breathed out by God. Theonoustos is the word. Theonoustos. Theos is God. Noustos, like uh, P-N-E-U, new, like, pneuma, like a pneumatic tire. It's filled with air, a pneumatic tool. Uh, it is breathed, literally, the breath of God. Scripture is breathed out by God to us. God uses people, normal people, to write down over time his word brought to them. And I want you to see that the Bible tells us that, that the scripture is literally breathed out by God. Second Peter 1 verse 20 and 21 says it this way, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Spirit. A miraculous thing. We have the scriptures breathed out into lives who put them down in words that we now have before us. So let's talk about this sola scriptura, scripture alone. First thing I want you to see is scripture is unique. You can say that scripture is exclusive. All scripture is breathed out by God. Now, we could talk a long time about the canon uh, that is the authoritative scripture. How did we get the Bible that we have? I've preached on that. You can go online and find, I think it was during our Explore God series, the reliability of scripture. How do we know that the scripture we have is passed on to us appropriately? And by the way, when we think it was passed on, we may have lost something. No, no, no. Um, Wycliffe, among others, came back around uh, Tyndale, came to the Greek and to the Hebrew, there's a bit of Aramaic, and, and translated the scriptures, not from the Vulgate, not from Middle English to Modern English, but instead from the Greek uh, all the way to us. So there's not this, this passing along. There's back to the original autographs. When we talk about the Bible being inerrant or infallible, we're talking about the original autographs. But I would say this, the scripture you have before you, the word of God uh, by his spirit has been guided, brought to us in our day, and we have all that we need for salvation and practice and life. You can trust the word of God. We'll talk about that today. We're not going to dive into the historicity of the text and all those things today, but we, we, it's worth talking about and, and studying. So now we have the scriptures in our language. There are still many groups of people on the planet who do not, which is why Wycliffe translators and others are seeking to continue to, to get the scriptures into people's hands so that they can read it themselves. And some of you have seen when the Bible goes into tribal areas where they do not have, uh, you can go online and see some of these stories and watch when, a script, when the Bible is presented to believers who don't have but parts of it. It's an amazing thing. I mean, weeping, celebration, it is an incredible thing, and we take for granted the fact that we have the Word of God in our language. But don't miss this, friends. Courageous men have died so that we might have the Bible in our own language. John Wycliffe was one who translated the Bible in, into English more than 100 years prior to Luther. He was the morning star of the Reformation. He was the one who pointed the way for the others uh, Luther, of course, was labeled a heretic as he sought to um, then, being, being tucked away, locked away, uh, where he then started to translate the Bible into German. Another was John Huss, who came before Luther as well, opposed the Pope and indulgences based on Scripture alone, as he understood. He was burned at the stake. Wycliffe, who, who's, who, who had come before him after they realized how much uh, John Huss was influenced by Wycliffe, who died of a stroke before they could kill him, he ends up, they exhume his body, they burn it, and they throw his ashes into the river Swift. After these guys, then come even more who would go on to translate the scriptures into other languages, and each time... They were met with opposition. William Tyndale translated the Bible from Greek and Hebrew, Aramaic, into English, into what was Middle English at the time. He was 
uh, strapped to a stake, strangled and burned as a result of translating the Bible into our language. Friends, we have a gift that we do not need to take for granted. These men, others believing that it was breathed out by God and given to us. Not only is it unique, it is effective. Look how it says it is profitable. It's useful. The theologians talk about the efficacy of Scripture. It's effective to change our lives. Now look at what it says there. I want you to see a little graphic that will help us understand this. It says that we, we're walking along. Here's what the scriptures do. It, teach, it teaches us how to walk, how to live our lives. Okay, so it's teaching. It, it teaches us how to get on path, right? As we walk this path, it shows us when we've gotten off the path, right? So it's good for, for, for correction. It shows us which way we've gotten off. Reproof, that's it. Reproof, it says, you have gotten off, watch out. And then it shows us how to get back on the track, all right? correction in training of righteousness, and that's how to stay on the path, all right? So scripture shows us the, the purpose of scripture is to point us to Jesus, the, the, the focus of scripture, but it's also to bring about this constant teaching of the Holy Spirit in our lives, to show us how to stay on the path that God has given us, to live to his glory. And here's the big difference. The, re- the reformers believed that God, listen, actually speaks through his word to you personally. Not even, yes, through a pastor, teacher, preacher, important, others who are teaching into your life, who understand context and exegesis and hermeneutical principles on how to truly appropriate scripture into our lives and not simply take things out of context, the genre of the actual context, what book you're looking at. All those things are important. But reformers, and yes, we believe that the Holy Spirit speaks through the Bible to you personally so that you're asking, what is God saying to me through this? So, so how do you apply it? Well, how will I obey and who will I tell? Well, how do you apply Scripture? Let's look at that. How can we apply Scripture? Just briefly today. First, you've got to read it. Are you in the Word is the great challenge today. With all that you've heard thus far and all that, that has gone on, that we might have the text in front of us, are you reading Scripture? Is it central to your life? Is Scripture alone your authority? And if you say, well, yes, it is. Well, are you reading it? Are you studying it? So we got to read it. we got to study it. That's why we have our connect groups here and, and, and trained uh, leaders that are able to teach and guide us. You meditate on it. You consider what God is saying to you. And you think through it and how to apply it. And then finally you obey it. Scripture doesn't come alive until you obey it. That's the power of God through his word. But I want you to see, too, that scripture applied, uh, even, you know, uh, like Luther, trying to do what the scripture says is not enough. You need to understand the focus of scripture. Jesus said it this way to the Pharisees who knew scripture well. John 5, 39, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. The great goal of scripture is to point us to Christ. So not only do we need to think about Scripture as unique, it's effective, we need to apply Scripture, and we need to focus, we need to take up the uh, Scripture's focus. And that focus is Christ and salvation that comes through Him and following Him that we might become like Him. The Scripture is the ultimate tool in your life to help you become like Jesus. I love Romans 15, 4. It says, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Friends, the Bible brings hope in these troubled days. When you're walking through troubled times in your life, the Bible brings hope. So you start to read the Scriptures, and you realize the question is not, what is God's will for my life? That's a legit question, but even better, what is God's will? What is he doing? Scripture shows us the great story of God, and he points us to Christ himself. But listen to this. Listen to Isaiah 55, verse 10 and 11. It says this, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall 
accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Listen, God's word will accomplish its purpose in your life. If you will study it, if you'll apply it, if you'll seek to live by it. What is God's purpose? 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That you would come to faith in Christ, that you would be sanctified, become like Jesus. Friends, listen, the Bible's unique. The Bible is effective. Apply it. Take up the focus of Scripture, which is your salvation. And in it, we find the words of God that lead us to be like Christ, the purpose of your life, to be saved, enter into relationship with him, and then to become like him. And to live that way is to bring glory to him. I'll close with this. 1,500 years, this, this Bible was written over the course of 1,500 years. Three different continents, in three different languages, 40 different authors, 66 books. These writers came from different places in life, different periods of time in history, different uh, seasons of their own lives. They wrote the Bible that we now have in our hands. Think about this. Addressing the most controversial issues known to man. And yet it tells one story about one person. And his name is Jesus Christ. And he is found from beginning all the way to the end. Only God can do that. This is the inspired word of God. May it be the focus of our lives. May we cherish it. May we love it. May we meditate on it. May we abide in Christ as the scriptures point us to him. And we live for him. And he sanctifies us that we might become like him to the glory of our Savior. Let's pray together. Lord God, we love your word. We thank you that the word points us to the word, the incarnate word, Jesus, our Savior. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us this great gift, a love letter in the end. And it shows us how much you love us and reminds us what our lives are all about. May we be a church, a people. May I, each of us, be a person who is in your word daily, seeking your face, seeking to follow you and know you. And Lord, I pray for anyone here who doesn't know you today, who's not received your grace, that now they would do so. As Cruz has led the way for us today through baptism. Friend, have you given your life to the Lord? You can do so now. He has shown you what is good. He's shown you his son. Jesus has come to save you from your sin. Give him your life today. He died on the cross for you so that you might be forgiven. He's given us his word, our authority for life practice for salvation. We give you our lives, Lord, and all that we are. We praise you, Jesus. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.